And let's remain standing as Reuben comes to read to us from the book of Romans this morning. Reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is Pentecost Sunday, so we're going to jump ahead a little bit in the book of Romans to a text that deals a little bit more directly with the Holy Spirit. It's all God's word. It's all dealing with the Holy Spirit because it's only the Holy Spirit who gives us the capacity to understand the word and to apply it to our lives. But in this case, I thought, well, we'll go ahead to Romans 8 and we will kind of hit this passage looking at it, not in as much detail as we might when we get back to it eventually, but looking at it from the standpoint of how God works in our lives by his spirit to accomplish his purpose and to assure us that we belong to him, body and soul, in life and in death. Now, just a few minutes ago, we sang that song by Margaret Clarkson, For Your Gift of God, the Spirit. And listen to the words of that first sentence that she has. For your gift of God, the Spirit, power to make our lives anew, pledge of life and hope, of glory. Savior, we would worship you. And of course, it is a worthwhile thing to worship the Lord for the gift of his Holy Spirit in our lives. Because according to Acts chapter 1, on the day of his ascension into heaven, Jesus gathered his disciples, and when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Which is a little bit of a non sequitur kind of question given the the circumstances, but we don't have time to address that this morning. Just that Jesus turned to them and he said, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. I will just say it's not for us either. But here was the promise that Jesus made to his disciples on that occasion. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He didn't merely, if we can say it in that way, promise that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them in some way. He said, when that happens, then you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, which is kind of like Jesus saying, you will be witnesses in High River and in Okotoks and in southern Alberta and in fact all the way to the ends of the earth. Having promised that they would receive power, having promised that that power was what they needed to equip them to do this work of bearing witness for Christ when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now Luke goes on in the narrative in the book of Acts, and he says, while they were gazing into heaven, we can just imagine them there, standing there. There's a classic painting where Jesus is at the top, and all you can see of him in the painting is his feet on a cloud as he disappears, and the disciples are looking on. And they're standing there gazing into heaven. We don't know exactly what was in their heart and mind. The scripture doesn't say. We could make some assumptions about it. It may be that they were thinking, okay, well, he's going and then he's going to come back right away or something we, we just don't know but what we do know is that as they were gazing after him two angels stood beside them clothed in white robes and said men of Galilee why do you stand looking into heaven this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven now we often 
associate that statement with the promise of Jesus' final return in glory when, according to the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1, the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's an aspect to that which is valid. But in John chapter 14, as we read in our call to confession this morning, Jesus himself had made a similar promise. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now again, some people have read that and thought, well, he's talking about the second coming. And when I say second coming, put quotation marks around that. Because we often use that to refer to the final coming. And there's good reason not to. But people have assumed that when Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Meaning, at the end of the age, when history is finished, when everything is kind of wound up and it's time, I will come back. But he was not talking merely about a second coming at the end of the world. In fact, he was talking about the promise that he had made just a couple of verses before when he said to the same group of people, if you love me, we read this earlier, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Some translations have it, comforter. I believe the word in Greek is paraclete, one who's called alongside to speak on our behalf or to help in some way. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now that's the basis for his statement in the very next verse. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. What Jesus was saying to his disciples in that upper room on that occasion was, I am going away. Now later on he'd say, that's good. It's good for you that I go away. We have a hard time imagining that because we think, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus was here in this world in person and we could go and sit down and chat with him. But Jesus said, it's a good thing that I'm leaving because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. So he's saying to his disciples, in effect, I am going away, but don't let that bother you. Don't let your heart be troubled I will not leave you on your own. I will come to you through the Holy Spirit. See, the next verse establishes the time frame for this, the true second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 14, verses 19 and 20 read, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, And you are in me, and I am in you. So this was something that was to happen in the disciples' own lifetime. See, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you was, in fact, the true second coming on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father and by the Son to be in and upon and with his people. That was Christ fulfilling this promise, I will come to you. In fact, I will be in you, Jesus says. And I would like us to pause there for just a moment. I would like us to consider the sheer magnitude of that statement. Not only will the Spirit be with us, he will be in us. The Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, just promised his disciples and through them he promised you and me that not only would he be God with us, Emmanuel, but he would also be in them. Which is to say exactly what Paul said in the verses immediately preceding the text that Reuben read for us a little bit earlier this morning. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
And if you are saved, and there's so many different ways I could say this. If you are saved, if you are a Christian, if you are born again by the Spirit of God, if you are in Christ, if you trust in Christ alone for your salvation, what that means is that the Spirit of God does dwell in you because anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now we can do what's called an inversion on that statement. Paul says anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So working it around the other way, anyone and indeed everyone who does belong to Christ absolutely has the spirit of Christ dwelling in him. There's no two-tier spirituality. There's no two-tier faith. Well, I have come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, and I've been saved, but I don't yet have the Holy Spirit. I'm awaiting some second work of grace in which the Spirit will come and do something else. If you have come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, first of all, you did so because the Holy Spirit was already at work in you, bringing you to that point where you would turn to him in faith. But secondly, the Holy Spirit didn't just show up and work in you all that was necessary for your salvation and then take off back to heaven, waiting until you were holy enough or spiritual enough or something for him to come and give you that second blessing. He came into you in your effectual calling. He worked in you faith and repentance. He brought you to the point of salvation through his regenerating work. And then he stayed. Because anyone who has the spirit belongs to Christ. And anyone who belongs to Christ has the spirit. Hence the second couplet in for your gift of God the spirit. Crowning gift of resurrection sent from your ascended throne, fullness of the very Godhead come to make your life our own. Now again, just let it sink in for a minute. Through the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Trinity dwells within the people of God. He has been sent forth from the Father and from the Son, And Clarkson's line here is just spot on. Come to make your life, the life of God, our life. Now, do you think that should give Christians a different perspective on the way that we look at life in this world? When Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples were gazing after him as he went. And the angel said, men of Galilee, why are you doing that? Why are you standing there gazing into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come again in the same way as you have seen him go, which I think has been taken to mean something entirely different from what it probably meant. But regardless of the subtleties of interpretation there, that statement by the angel certainly carried the force of, guys, there is nothing to be gained by standing here, gazing into heaven and speculating about when Jesus might return in glory. You have a job. On another occasion, which we sometimes associate with the ascension, but it couldn't have been the ascension because it happened in Galilee, and the ascension took place on the Mount of Olives in Judea. But on that occasion in Galilee, Jesus was also out on a mountain, and he said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's saying, I am king of the universe, guys. <laughs> now go. And as you go, in light of the fact that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, disciple the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you to do, and I will be with you always, not only with you, but in you, as we've seen, to the very ends of the ages. And so these angels come and they say, why are, you, why are you standing here looking into heaven wondering about what just happened and when it might happen again in reverse? 
Go on into the town and wait like Jesus told you to do until you receive power from on high. And then when you have received that equipping power of the Holy Spirit, go into the world and get busy doing what Christ told you to do. The thing is, in the intervening centuries, a lot of Christians have spent a lot of time and a lot of money essentially gazing into heaven, speculating. As evidence, I would just offer you, among other things, the Left Behind series of books and movies. What was that if not a whole lot of heaven gazing and speculation? But here's the thing. God's people will never be left behind. We were not even left behind when Jesus ascended. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And because Jesus is God and because God always keeps his promises, he did what he said. He came to them. He came to be with them. And better still, he came to be in them through his Holy Spirit. Us too. Or do you not know, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. Jesus came to the church through the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and he continues to do that in all of his people. Everyone who has come to him through faith and has experienced new birth and salvation, his Spirit dwells within us. Now, think about that next time you're tempted. Like, <laughs> wherever you go, whatever you do, you're dragging the Holy Spirit of God along with you into that situation. That in itself ought to be enough to help us stand a little stronger than we often do. So you are not divine. You are not little gods, as some have taught. That's just one of the heresies of the Word of Faith movement. But the Spirit of Christ Jesus dwells in you. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And what more could you want? What more could you need to equip you to live and walk in this world? What, what, what more could we ask of God than the reality that he dwells in us through his Holy Spirit? I don't care how bad we may perceive the world to be or even how bad it really is. It doesn't matter. He, the mighty God, indwells us. And again, I feel like we, we don't reckon with that often enough. We look at the world and, and we look at the news and we look at what's going on all around us and we feel helpless and we think, oh, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus would just come back? My mother... <laughs> Dear lady that she was and saint of God used to say all the time, she'd watch the news and she'd oh, even so, come Lord Jesus, just make this end. That's not how we're meant to look at this world, as if we need Jesus to return because until he gets back, we're missing something. There's some piece of the equation that's not there. He, the mighty God, indwells us. Has God equipped us then to live in this world? Has God equipped us to do his will, to walk in holiness, to stand against all of the plots and schemes of the world, the flesh, and the devil? He, the mighty God, indwells us, Clarkson wrote, his to strengthen, help, empower. That's God's job. His to overcome the tempter. Ours to call in danger's hour. Now how do we know that he, the mighty God, indwells us? Well, Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. There's going to be so much more to say about this later on, but for this morning, I just kind of want you to get not the details, but just the full force of this text. Let it speak in its fullness. I think it will refresh your soul. For all who are led by the Spirit of God 
are sons of God. Do you understand the weight of that statement? Do you really believe it? Yeah, but I'm getting older now. I'm not as strong as I used to be. The doctor says I'm sick. I haven't ticked all the boxes on my bucket list. And it's starting to look like I never will. But just stop. And if I can use a very Pauline expression here, reckon with the truth of this verse. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The Apostle John put it in a little different way. He said, see, behold, I wish the modern translations would not do away with that word. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God of God and regarding all that other stuff, all the trials and struggles and garbage that's happening in the world, all that fear of missing out, all of that regret and sorrow, well, verse 15, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. It's just the same word in two different languages. Abba is Aramaic, Father is translated from the Greek. What he's saying here is, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we approach the living God. That's who you, in theory, came here to worship this morning. You came here to approach the living God, the Holy One. The one who by the word of his power brought into being everything that exists. The Lord of heaven and earth. And because you have received the spirit of adoption as his son. You come here and you dare to reach out and call him father. What an amazing truth. And when Satan shows up in one of his many disguises, and he's got myriads of them. Even if he shows up as an angel of light, and he says, who do you think you are? You don't belong here. You're nothing. You're pond scum. We can and we should to stand up and smile and say, I know, right? But have you met my dad? Have you met the living God who by his grace through the spirit of holiness has given me the privilege of coming into his presence and saying, Abba, Father. Jesus used those words in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible. For you. And when we are tempted to listen to the voice of the accuser, however that voice may come to him, to us, we need to just say, you know what? It's true. Paul said in Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. And that includes every one of us sitting here. And yet God, by his grace, has called us by his spirit, has given us life, has sealed us, has filled us, has worked in us all that is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. Next time somebody runs you down, just say, yeah, it's true, but dad, (laughs) have you met him? And besides that, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, 
but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit was given, among other things, to assure us that is true. And so again, the accuser shows up and he starts pointing fingers and look at your sin. Look at all that garbage in your life. And we say, yeah, but you know what? This is what true faith looks like. I trust not in my own works, not in my own righteousness, not in anything to do with myself. I trust in Jesus Christ alone. And because I do, God now sees me just as if I had never sinned or been a sinner. Just as if I was as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Wow. We think about inheritances and, you know, maybe some of us have occasionally thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a really, really, really rich dad? Well, if you belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you are an heir of God. And a fellow heir with Christ, the kingdom that God is giving to him, he is giving to all of his people provided. Paul says that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. He, the mighty God, indwells us, the song says. And because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? In fact, in his strength, Margaret Clarkson goes on, we dare, we dare to battle all the raging hosts of sin and by him alone we conquer. All of this is so wound up in Romans chapter 8. I could go on and on. Paul says, what shall we say to these things? What can remove us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Persecution, death, famine, plague, any of these? No. In all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Christ Jesus, who is our Lord. And again, let me ask, do you believe that? Next time you're online and you're looking and you're seeing uh, World War III, you know, all the things... Just ask yourself, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord over heaven and earth and everything in them? If by grace through faith you are in Christ, then it is absolutely and unequivocally true. You are a child of God and a fellow heir of Christ. And to anticipate the next bit of Romans chapter 8, no matter what the world, the flesh, and the devil are throwing at you right now, no matter what you're experiencing, what you're enduring, what you're struggling with, Paul says the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And when Paul wrote that, people were suffering in ways we have not yet imagined. And he said, don't worry about it. It's not even worth a thought compared to the glory that God is going to reveal in us and to us. This is the word. This is the promise of the Lord to all those who trust in him. So, how should we then live? Well, the whole book of Romans, the whole Bible. This is not a sermon saying, since we have all of these promises in Christ, we don't have to even think about how we should then live, not at all. The whole book of Romans goes into this, and for this morning, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 14. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Grace cannot be earned or deserved in any way but when God gives his grace there ought to be a sense in our heart that we are now debtors to him for the grace that he has shown us in Christ Jesus our Lord not to the flesh to live according to the flesh Paul says verse 13 for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live 
So grace is not God coming along and saying, just live however you want, do what's right in your own eyes, have fun, and in the end, grace will cover it all. Grace is actually the power of God to make our lives anew, as Margaret Clarkson wrote. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. There will be so much more to say, but let me close this morning with a prayer. It's the final stanza of the hymn that we're going to sing in just a moment. But let me pray it here first, and then we'll pray it together as we stand and sing. Father, grant your Holy Spirit in our hearts may rule today. Grieved not, quenched not, but unhindered. Work in us his sovereign way. Fill us with your holy fullness, God, the Father, Spirit, Son, in us, through us, then forever, shall your perfect will be done. Amen.